cartoon, but then it also has Trump in a casket. And I saw that recently, and somebody was like, hurry up. The Simpsons have been right about everything else, and they had the picture of Trump in a casket, and I'm like, it's just so much hate that is just crazy, and that's what keeps us divided. And this whole government with Democrat, Republican, Republicans is meant to keep us divided. Because at the end of the day, they and they big mansion having dinner together. <laughs> Out front, they fighting, they arguing, they disrespecting each other, but at, when it's all said and done, they all on the same team. Because it's one agenda. It is one agenda. So we have to stop crying out to Pharaoh. So what can we do to overcome these systems? Again, it's not going to change, but what can we do as people? So I didn't go much into slavery, but we're on page two. Slavery in America started in 1619 when the first slaves were brought from Africa to Jamestown, Virginia. So that lasted for years. Then we have, we heard enough about slavery, so I didn't go into that much. The Civil War in the United States began in 1861. And after decades of simmering tensions between northern and southern states over slavery, um, states, state rights, and western expansion. Now the war ended in 1865, and this began the process of freeing slaves. And we know that Lincoln, through the 13th Amendment and the Emancipation Proclamation, made it unconstitutional for someone to be held as a slave. So it granted all freedom, it granted freedom to all Americans, but there was an exception. And that exception was criminal. So if you went to jail, you went to prison, your 13th Amendment was over. You did not have freedom. You were basically a slave again. So. What they did was they really handled us very carefully and they, to keep that slavery going, these systems were made. So, um, um, so now if you go to jail, your freedom is taken away. But 40 acres and a mule. So after the Civil War, right, the, um, General William T. Sherman Special Field Order Number 15 was the source of 40 acres and a, and a mule. And there were three important parts about um, um, 40 acres and a mule, three different sections. And the first section, and, and after we, well, let me go through the sections. Section one, the islands from Charleston south, the abandoned rice fields along the rivers for 30 miles back from sea. So from Charleston, um, South Carolina, all the way down to Florida, they reserved land for black, to give black people 40 acres, right? Section two, the new communities will be governed entirely by black people themselves. On the islands and in the settlements, no white person whatever, unless military officers and soldiers detailed for duty will be permitted to reside. And the sole and exclusive management of affairs will be left to the free people themselves. Section three, each family shall have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground in the possession of which the land, the military authorities will afford them protection until such time as they can protect themselves. So this was kind of radical to <laughs> go from being a slave to then having all this land and understanding that black people are who work the field. So you know what they would have did each family with this land? And, and you know that they work the field. See, there's just something very special about us. I just love talking because we're so special because, you know, we can be out in the sun all day and not have to worry about skin cancer. <laughs> See, they couldn't do that. You know, I worked for a dermatologist for almost five years and not one case of skin cancer came and was a black person. See, we're so special. Our skin, our hair, we don't get lice. We don't get skin cancer. We're just, we're just special. And I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from anybody else, but. I just love us. You know, the way that God made us, we are just special. But can you imagine if they really got all this, black people would have taken over. Somebody became smart and said, oh no, <laughs> this can't happen, okay? Uh-uh, we have to figure out a way to get this order revoked because we cannot give them the opportunity to do this. 
from, from, from South Carolina to Florida, we would have taken over. And somebody got smart and said, mm-mm, I really believe Lincoln's assassination was because of that, honestly, to tell you the truth. I really believe that's why that man was assassinated. So the new president, as he did, came in and was like, nope, mm-mm, taking that back, y'all ain't getting that. Because we would, we would have ruled. Because that's just how we do. We're, we're with the littlest, with nothing, we make something out of it. And somebody became smart and was like, uh-uh, we're not going to let them. Mm -mm. They've been slaves all these years. We, you think we're going to give them all this? Mm -mm. No. So 40 acres and a mule, over and done with, right? So now, so now I have up next the um, Ku Klux Klan, KKK. This Klan first emerged after the Civil War in an effort to intimidate Southern blacks. Now, Let's keep in mind that these are systems that's been put in place, okay? So slavery, 40 acres of mule, been revoked. Now we go into this clan who terrorizes black people. Terrorizes. Um, um, in an effort to intimidate Southern blacks to stay out of politics and exploit the labor because remember the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote, do all that stuff. So now, um, now we gotta figure out a way to intimidate them so that they won't do any of the stuff that, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Deborah wanted to you say. I just wanted to mention that on slavery, um, after it was um, ended, many blacks didn't know that. That's why we came with Juneteenth, for the fact that for an entire year or more, they didn't know they were free slaves. Very true, yep. So now we have the Civil War, well, um, their ex and exploit their labor. So, and this is all the Reconstruction era. Um, and at this time, they didn't last that long. The Q they came, KKK came back on the scene some years later. So nearly 50 years later in 1915, um, Colonel William Joseph Simmons revived the Klan after seeing Birth of a Nation, which portrayed the Klansmen as great heroes. Now this movie, Birth of a Nation, they had black men running around raping white women, or trying to rape white women. That is the image that was portrayed of them. When we know the reality is, is that the white men was raping black men, black women, black children, but they wanted to make an image of the black man. And when this movie came out, and they had, there was a, a one part in that movie where a woman jumped off the cliff because she's about to be raped by a black man. So she'd rather kill herself before she was raped by this black man. But this is the image, and we'll go into that too when we talk about media. This is the image that they have portrayed of us when we weren't the villains. We were the victims. Yeah, yeah, so, but this is the image, and what happens is it's a programming thing, it's a mind thing. When you're seeing, uh, we'll go and see, I get excited, but we'll go into this with media, but when we see, even today, we turn on the TV, and all you see is black, black, black crime, and black men in handcuffs, and then it's like, okay, we're only 12% of the population. I think six and a half percent of is black men, so five and a half is black women. We're only 12% of the population. White people make about 60% of the population, but all we see is black crime on TV. So white people don't, <laughs> they don't, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, but this is, this is what they, this is what, from, from the jump, this is how they portrayed us. One of the things about media back then, it was the beginning of silent films, so that oftentimes blacks didn't have the opportunity to see how they were being portrayed. So they didn't know really why they were afraid of them, because they hadn't seen it, and some of them did not know how to read. So with that too, it was written with subtitles, so it was a lot that they were putting in the mind of white folks. Yeah, but it still goes through today. I always thought with the Ku Klux Klan, if they were so powerful, why did they hide? Why are they hiding behind masks? You know, working prominent jobs, but they hide behind their mask, so we don't know who they are. And that's and you know what? That's one of the reasons too why. Um, Christianity was a turnoff to so many people because they claim to be Christians. And then that's what we saw as Christians. So we're so, you know, we, 
we hear things and we associate it. So that's what we saw as Christians. So, so it was like, well, how can you be a Christian and live that way? But no, we have to understand. We have to go by the word and what the word tells us. So who, I don't care if you say you're a Christian, you got to live like one. And if you ain't living like one, then you ain't one. You know, but that's, but that's, um, but that's the, the, some of the reasons. Because you hear a lot, um, Christianity is a white man's religion. No, it's not. No, it's not. We, in Africa before he brought over here, we knew who God was, you know what I mean? So even before we came over here, it's just a matter of when we were brought over here, you for, they, they brainwash you, they beat stuff out of you, they, they make you forget who you were, they renamed you, they took away your, your, real, your true names and named you, you know, um, Smith, no, that's not our names. You know, and, and it makes you forget who you are, so generation after generation, you're forgetting your, your roots and where you're, where you're originally from. All of them is not black men that are doing that. It's actually white men in black face or black mat or black paint. So you see the portrayal of what we think is a black man, but it's actually a white man raping his own and stuff like that. So that's where the distortion comes in at. So. Anybody else? Oh. Hiding behind mask and face paint. They don't want us to know who they are. And that makes us more afraid because we don't know what they are during the daylight hours. And again, it makes us not trust. Yeah. Well, let's see. So, and, and after the movie, so because of this movie, the KKK resurfaced and began terrorizing blacks and of course the lynching, the murdering, the fire, all kinds of stuff they were doing to our people. And um, yeah, so we'll, but we're gonna come back into the media. So now Jim Crow. As you make your way back to your Jim seat. Crow, the laws, Jim Crow laws. Let's rejoice this morning for the Lord is good. Were a collection of states and local statutes that legalized racial segregation and then the American South. For well, the Lord is good. The end of Reconstruction. And mercy and do it forever and forever. And the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s. So Jim Crow permanently made us second class citizen. They did not look at us. Well, clap your hands, or just other shows that came on. We were we were portrayed like like animals. Clap those hands with us, y'all. And, and and just like that, we weren't people. Um, and this and Jim Crow is what is so made simply said, I believe. Citizens. And it was meant to marginalize us by denying us the, the right to vote. If you believe, clap your hands with us. Education and other opportunities. Here we go. And those Jehovah. Arrest, fines, jail, sentences, jail oh, sentences, Lord. violence, and death. Jehovah. And Jim Crow bought on, of course, the segregation. It bought on black codes. It bought on convict leasing. And we're going to go into that now. Um, the black codes. When slavery was legally abolished, a new set of laws called the black codes oh, emerged to criminalize legal activity for African. In the early years of Reconstruction, most blacks in rural areas of the South were left without land, you are, come on. forced to work you as laborers in large God. white-owned farms and plantations in order to earn a living. And through the enforcement of these laws, blacks such as standing in one area of town or walking at night, for example, became the criminal acts of loitering or breaking curfew for which African Americans were in prison. Now at this I time, believe, this was the first biggest prison book. Before slavery was I abolished, believe. it was hardly anybody being I going to prison. It was Jehovah, more white people, on, but very few. Of course, we had this, we had black people under control, but now because of the 13th Amendment, <laughs> everybody is free except criminals. Now it didn't matter; you could blink wrong and you was going to jail. So this was just another form of slavery, but they did it. But it, to them, it was I legal trust. now. You know, it was, it, it, they gave them a reason. And this is, and you'll hear me say it a few times, they handled us, they, they knew how to handle us to keep us in this, in the same mind frame. So the black holes started out the um, biggest prison, the first prison boom, I should say, not the biggest, because now we got two, two, two million plus people in, in prison. But um, 
But this is what started the, the first big prison boom when they were just arresting black people for no reason, just to get them, well, for, not for any reason, but to get them back on these plantations and out working um, um, free again. But as a result, like the percentage of African Americans in prison grew exponenti um, exponentially. These black holes provoked a fierce resistance against the freedmen and undermined support in the North for President Johnson's reconstruction policies. A Republican victory in the congressional elections of 1866 led to the passage of the Reconstruction Acts in 1867, beginning a new phase of Reconstruction. And now we go on to convict leasing. And I have to tell you, in my study, I never even heard of convict leasing. Um, this is my first time actually hearing about it. But in my study and for, to prepare for this tonight, came across convict leasing. Um, and it's a system, a system of convict leasing was developed to allow white slave plantation owners in the South to literally purchase prisoners to live on their property and work under their control. Just another form of slavery. And through this system, and now you look at it now, the system, they make good money off men in prison, off men and women in prison. Each head they get in thousands of dollars. And that's why it's overcrowded in these prisons. That's why you see our expansion on, on DCJ here, because they make money off of our people being criminalized. And we'll talk about that more when we come into the war on drugs, the war on crime, and mass incarceration. But um, so through this system, bidders paid an average of 25,000 a year to the state in exchange for control over the lives of all prisoners. And this system provided revenue for the state and profits for plantation owners. And it's the same thing because even now in prison, um, I don't think Victoria's Secret does it anymore, but there was a couple big companies like Victoria's Secret, um, I know Idaho Potatoes, they were having the prisoners um, grow their potatoes, having the prisoners making their, making their products, paying nothing, of course, and, and look at all the money they're making off of that. But I know that once they were found out, a lot of them pulled out, but they're still having prisoners. Um, these big companies who make boo-hoo amounts of money a year are having the prisoners working and, and making their products. Um, so the revenue is for state, is for companies, and um, is for, and, so many people profit off of them going to jail. And much like the system of slavery from which it emerged, convict leasing was a violent and abusive system. And by the 1930s, every state had abolished it. So I don't want to say short-lived, it should never happen, but you know, eventually. And another example of them handling us delicately, because you got to understand, they still haven't taken responsibility for what was done. They'll never admit they were wrong. And the reason why they'll never admit that they were wrong is because then they got the pay. So we look at the Holocaust, we look at other things, they have been paid. America is paying the Holocaust victim. They have nothing to do with it. Yet, we can't get reparations. And they'll never admit to it because they will have to pay. And it's, it's like um, 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 the Israelites when they were in slavery, if you read Exodus. Now, one thing I, I love that I've learned to open up and really read the Bible, not just it's the word of God, but for the stories. Because their, their story with slavery is parallel to ours. The difference, the difference between their story is that they got paid. They were given, well, they, they, they got gold and stuff when they left, when, they, when, when Moses kept saying, let, let my people go, let my people go, and then Pharaoh finally let them go. But they got paid for the slavery. And you're supposed to get paid for your work. You're supposed to get reparations when things, if somebody hits your car, what you do? You, you get reparations for that. You don't pay for your car if you got insurance if, if, if somebody hits it, right? If, if you work, if you go to McDonald's and work, and they don't pay you, what do you do? You bring them to court. You get reparations, you get paid for your work. We still haven't got paid for our free work. We haven't got paid for it. And that's because they have not admitted they were wrong, and they never will. They never will because if they did, everything is ours. <laughs> everything is ours. And you know, the thing is that we don't get taught this 
And I think that even for white people, they don't get taught it, they don't get taught either. So, and they'll never understand um, what, what we go through even today as black people and what they'll never understand. And a lot of them say things like, well, it wasn't me, but you're the beneficiary. You know, you're living off of what your ancestors did. So if, if it wasn't you and you want to make up, give me, give me a, a stake in that bank that you own and some of that land you got. Give us, some, give us our 40 acres. You know what I'm saying? But, but, and, and, and they take it as being racist or no, 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 no. We just old and, and we deserve it. But anyway, sharecropping was another part of handling us delicately. So that came in. Um, dis and despite giving African Americans the right of citizens, the federal government took little concrete action to help free blacks in the quest to own their own land. So instead of, instead of receiving wages for workers on owner's land and having to submit to supervision and harsh discipline, most freedmen preferred to rent land for a fixed payment rather than receive wages. And a lot of black men did do this at that time because, again, they didn't have to, they had their own, well, I'm not gonna say their own land, but they rented and they did what they needed to do, then gave what they needed to give to the owners, but they received money to be able to live and do what they, what they needed to do. And by the early 1870s, the system known as sharecropping had come to dominate agriculture across the cotton plant south. Under this system, black families would rent small plots of land or shares to work themselves. In return, they would give a portion of their crop to the landowner at the end of the year. Um, Stacy, yes. um, one thing about sharecropping, and my father was a sharecropper, mm -hmm. and I found out more information because when we had gone to the um, African American Museum in Maryland, my cousin was with us, he has since passed on. Um, he told us he was with him. And what would happen is they would work the land not only did you pay back, but then, remember, he let you live in a little house on the land, so you owed him at the end. You didn't even make anything, because by the end, you was owing more than what you worked. And another, another point I want to make, um, there, was a, there was some of the former slaves that did get their 40 acres and leave. Um, Tillery, North Carolina, was a town that was settled by former slaves. Pull up the government charter on that, it explains that. Just, just a tidbit I'm throwing out there. Anything else? Anybody else? So now we're moving on to media and the music and the movies and how we are portrayed going back when we're talking about um, um, Birth of a Nation. But the media, we have to understand, is owned by the European Jews. So they're gonna, they're gonna um, portray what they wanna portray and show what they wanna show. And they have used the media to cascade a certain image of us. And when we see, I was um, listening, I was, I was, there's a 13th Amendment, the 13th doc, um, documentary, and they were, at this time, it was um, Nixon and Reagan and, and Bush and the Clintons, and that's when in the eighties when crime when they well about the 50s, 60s when crime rised. And, but when they were talking about black people, when super predators they're calling us and, and, and beast, this is what they see. This is what they see. This is how they feel about us. And then it even goes down to how the police see us. And why it's so easy for them just to kill one of us because of how we are being portrayed in the media. And again, goes back to the programming and, and, and the, even the respect and they make us, and what happens too also with the way they portray us is that when something happens like that, when we get gunned down, when our children get gunned down, um, the, the way they portray us, it makes you feel like, well, they look at how they act. They deserve to be treated like that or, and not everybody, but that's, that's in the minds of people because they see us as rapists, they see us as drug dealers, they see us as um, killers, they see us as killing our own. So when something does happen to one of us, well, it's no, it's no issue, it's like whatever. 
but this is what the media does. And, and even when I talk to like my young people about the, the stuff that we watch on TV and, and the housewives, for example, just the way that our women are portrayed. And some of them, women with degrees, you know, they got masters, they have degrees, they can be, but they're on here just fighting and acting crazy and cussing and, and then our men. I was thinking about movies that I grew up on that I say is um, classics. Menace to Society, what's that movie about? Killing each other, smoking crack, but that's a classic, you know, Boys in the Hood. Now it's showing us what's going on in some of these hoods, but those are the things in my mind that are classic, but those are things that are representing us. Like, if you think about it, what positive television shows about black people on TV? Especially when I was growing up, they had good times. The black family struggling in any way. We had Sandra and Sean, you know, just love. We had nothing positive. And the one, and the one positive um, TV show that we did have, the Cosbys, what they do to Bill Cosby? 40 years later, when this man is about to die, destroy his legacy. Destroyed his legacy. Now, whether he did it or not, I really don't even care. I don't even care. Destroyed this man's legacy. This is what they do. Hold on one second for me. Um, Here's the thing, Stacey. Um, in our society, because movies are made that depict us as villains or drug dealers or just are demeaning to us. Those are the highest grossing movies out there. Folks will go out in droves to see those. Anything positive with us, people aren't going out to see it, not even us. So we have to turn that around. So when you're saying this, we play a big part too because we'll go out and see a joke movie. We'll go out and see Tyler's movies. I love Tyler Perry, don't get me wrong. I've got a lot of them. But we need to be more proactive. When we see movies about slavery, we know that they're going to make a lot of money. We should not be going to see those movies. We need to know what's going on, but we don't need to need, need to see another slave movie. But those movies make money. And this is a capitalist society. It's all about the money. Prison to make money. Who are they going to victimize? They're going to victimize us. So let's lock up the black people. Let's kill the black people. Let's do what we need to do to keep them there and we buy into it because we see it over and over and over again. We have to get out there and, and be more positive. We gotta present ourselves positively and we have to come together. We've not been able to do that. Again, if we could just take one day, pick a day, one day in a year, and say we're not supporting any businesses that are not owned by black folks, we will shut this system sure. down. Okay. But we can't do it because we're like crabs in a barrel. I'm not doing it because you said so. It wasn't my idea, so I'm not going to do it. So we have to change the way we think and how we interact. I, I agree with that, too. You know, uh, we have to take some responsibility with that. But I also think some of our slave movies can also be an encouragement to fight to see where our people have come from and to see what we should be still fighting for. Because they, the fight that they went through to get so we could be where we are, so we could speak freely, so we can vote freely, I think it should always be seen. I don't think it's, we should be hidden. We have a lot to be proud of too. So I think it's a fine line of what, when we say we don't wanna see slavery, I think it can also be an encouragement as well. Because we, we need our children, our new generation, they need to see how our people fought for them. How our mothers and fathers and the kings and queens, how we're standing on their shoulders and they should be doing the same thing. Our prisons are full, our schools are failing and all the things that are going on with our children, they need to see what our people have fought for because it's our legacy. Whether white people or other people give it to us or not, they need to see where they're going and where they're coming from. And 
I want to piggyback off of both Mana and Sylvia because it's so true. I think because black history really isn't sought in school and then our people don't really know, they're not taught, they only know what they hear, what, a, what their parents or grandparents have told them. So just like the movie that's out now, Harriet Tubman, a, a lot of times, it's sad to go and see this, but it's reality and we need to know because that's what's gonna encourage us so we could stand on our ancestors and on our forefathers that helped us get to where we are now. We, we, we haven't arrived yet and we are on still struggle because these systems are still set in place, but we need to be educated. Unfortunately, it's these types of movies and this kind of stuff has given us some of the education because a lot of it is not being offered in school. Three quick points, two quick points. <clears throat> One, about the black codes that you spoke about and doing my research, my presentation, you're right, a lot of um, legal activities were made illegal through the black codes. Illegal to buy property, it was illegal for us to vote, illegal for us to interracially marry. And some of those laws were still into effect into the mid 60s, you know, I think Alabama was the last state to knock down interracial marriage. So that's one thing I want to talk about. The other thing I want to talk about is that um, as an African American man, uh, keeping with your theme about the African American and his conscience. There's so many things that play that go into our subconscious that we act out on. So when we see these movies about the pimps and the drug dealers and the hustlers, and we watch these videos, we want to grow up to be like that. You know? We're going to have a 70s a theme, theme party for my uh, family reunion in September, and I'm going as Silky Slim. <laughs> so these are the images that are impressed upon our conscience. You know, they're not positive for the most part. So we need more things that are positive. And um, um, shameless plug, but in, in my studies, I was gonna talk about um, the lady from Poughkeepsie that became the first uh, federal judge in the United States, uh, Sue Bolin, Jane Bolin. And then we look at um, uh, Miss Johnson that died yesterday. So you're right, we, we come on the backs and the heels of people that have died for us, for our freedoms. So we talk about a citizenship People have died for us to become, to, to do the things we're able to do right now. So there's so many times where you say, well, he's the first to do this. She's the first to do that. That's a landmark because they didn't have the opportunity to buy land. They didn't have the opportunity to go to school, but still they found a way to do it. So those are the two things I wanted to mention. One thing that used to always bother me, I went to predominantly white schools and it seems like black people just started to exist during slavery. I would like for people to start with Africa. That's where we started. When you start in trying to enrich children about who they are, show them the people before we came to this country, who we are, what we were, what we were about. When you came here, they, what they did, the slavery was called channel slavery. It's different than what was going on in Africa. Because yes, Africans did have slaves. They were indentured servants, totally different. So we need to be able to uplift our kids, but give them our history, all of it. Yeah, absolutely, I definitely. Because it's like, when you go to school, we start at slavery. Okay, so what were we doing before that? So we were just born, and we were just slaves, and then Martin Luther King came along with I Have a Dream, and then Rosa Parks didn't get out her seat. Like, so what? <laughs> like, so what happened? You know? you got to go back you got to dig back you started from us and from that history will be, will tell you what went on so that the fact that you wanted to deny that the fact is I had a co-worker a week ago that came in to my office saying or to my into my particular office and saying oh I, I did my DNA and I'm 29% black and I looked at it she said why are you not surprised I said why are you <laughs> Absolutely. And then, you know, a lot of our history has been erased. So much of it has been erased so that we don't know who we are. You know, it's, but, I mean, there's other ways to, to figure things out, like even with old maps and stuff. Like I have a, 
if you come into my if you come into my place, I got maps on the wall. Like I do study and I'm like mapping old maps and how geography has changed, how now they name different it's so much to it. I'm saying preparing for this, I was like, oh my God, my mind was like, uh, because I was just trying to pull out simple things and you only have a certain amount of time, but it's so much to all of this. But but moving on. The um so systems that have been I want to keep that in our mind. Systems that have been um, put in place to keep us oppressed. So media, where was we at? Oh, Hollywood purposely put these stereotypes on black people to justify what has been and still being done to us. It justifies the terrible ways they have treated us and treat us. And many, many TV shows, music, movies portray us, especially black men as savages, animals, Super predator, killers, beasts, they portray black women as whores, desperate, ghetto, and ratchet. And again, this is what our children, especially in the in the in the in the music, you know, they say Chicago has the big the highest rate of gun violence. Right? But guns are illegal, I mean, in Chicago, right? So it's like, okay. I mean they're illegal, but they but they have the highest gun rates. And I say this. Like um, Minister Gill was saying, like we grow up watching these pimps and Superfly and and, and um, whoever else, but we grow up and we want to be like them. I believe. I mean, the Bible says that um, powers and and a life or death is in the power of the tongue, right? The music that our kids are listening to talks about killing each other, talks about sexual promiscuity, talks about all these things that our kids are listening to on a daily basis and dancing to and gyrating to. And, and so that stuff is getting in their subconscious. And that's how they're living things out. I truly believe, and this is why I say another system is, is the media. They put millions and millions of dollars into music, into why don't we stop putting out this gangster rap and gangster hip hop and put some money towards some college. They won't do that because the purpose is to kill us off. Comes to eugenics. Genocide, it was destruction of a certain race. Say a certain race, I say destruction of the black race. There's so many things that have been put in place for, they tried to take us out in slavery, they tried to take advantage of us and do what they want, but for some reason we just won't go anywhere. And that is because who got us? So we just won't go anywhere. So there's been several times, and I, I posted this up as a part of Black History Month. We have slavery try to take us out when it comes to genocide and eugenics. Abortion, you know, it's like, when we look at the rate of abortion, especially in black women, um, we talk about, like, you know, we complain, ain't no men, ain't no men, because you, you killed too many of them. You know, it's like, and, and homosexuality is another way that genocide because now black men are not making babies. Um, we have abortion, we have homosexuality, I forgot what else. But the media, the music, the killing of it, like all this stuff is contributing to us losing our black men and women and our, and our, and our kids and, and the blue on black crime. Tamir Rice, I have him on here, 12 year old boy, playing with a toy gun. Cop kills him, shoots him and kills him. Playing with a toy gun, he's 12, years old, that is how they see us, thought he had a gun. This boy, this kid is playing with a toy gun, minding his business, and you kill him. That is how they see us, doesn't matter what age. Doesn't matter what age, and that is because years and years and years, the media has portrayed us as a certain. And now, um, and also, it was a time where I used to say, well, we doing it to ourselves, and I, I listen, I don't, I don't say, we still have work to do, absolutely. But there are systems that's been put in place that we don't even know that's there. Because guess what? We're not learning about it. We're not learning about this. So I don't, I, you will never hear me again say it's completely our fault. Now, yeah, it, you know, some of us, we, it's some things that we need to do better, absolutely. But you will never hear me say that as us because this system has been put in place to keep us where we are. And again, we don't know about it until we do our research and we see what's really going on. When you learn things and you have, when you have some education other than the school education and you know what's really going on, then you can um, finagle and do things. But when you don't know what's going on, you just, you just living. Well, I can't do this, so, well, I'm a, we, 
you got to know what's going on, and we got to learn more about what's going on to prepare us and to get us to get us so that we can overcome and 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 be who we are. I was outraged when that white police officer only got 10 years for killing that black guy in Dallas. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then not only that, the black person that spoke up was killed three days later because they said he was doing a drug deal. And we know what time it is. Just one quick point. Um, the media has always had us in a negative manner. And the one thing that I always think about when I think about how negatively they treat us is the Oscar Awards when Denzel Washington won for being a thug, a crooked cop, and just an overall horrible individual. And that's what he portrayed, that's what they portray us as. And then I think it was the very next year, Holly Berry got an award for lady and of course it's you know the, the treatment that or the way they portray us is all being put in the media and shown as opposed to a role that they played that they were absolutely phenomenal in they didn't get it but they get it for being a whore excuse my language and a thug it just doesn't make sense but that's how they see us and then you have I have um, a co-worker who lost her son accident the young man was involved in, but a captain in the Department of Corrections walks up to her after he found out that she, her son had passed away and asked flat out, was it a drug deal? And I looked at him and I said, are you serious? That's what you just asked this woman who lost her son? But that's what they portray us as and that's what they think of us as. The media controls the narrative and once you control the narrative, you control the mind because people buy into what you're saying. So it's not just people of color, people who have no melanin in their skin, everybody buys into it. So when they look at us, it's easy to say, my 10-year-old child who may be taller than average, it's okay, he's a grown-up in their eyes. Mm -hmm. So if he makes a move, sudden move, he could end up dead. Because again, once you're controlling everything that you're seeing, then you already have So now, um, Black Wall Street. And I put Black Wall Street in because this, is, this is, inspires me. Because from little to nothing, look at what they built. Look at what our people built. But um, I'm not gonna go, it's a, it's a lot in here. But um, form slaves with the tribes and integrated into tribal communities. Um, acquired a lot of land in Greenwood. Um, so this is why I wanna, O.W. Gurley, a wealthy black landowner, purchased 40 acres of land in, Tel in Tulsa, naming it Greenwood after the town in Mississippi. And this goes to what McManor was talking about. Gurley started with a boarding house for African Americans. Then word began to spread about opportunities for blacks in Greenwood, and they flocked to the district. Um, other prominent black entrepreneurs followed suit. Born in slavery, um, Stratford, born in slavery, later becoming a lawyer and activist, moved to Greenwood. He built a 55-room luxury hotel bearing his name. Um, the part of working together. The part of working together. Um, the first guy, I forget his name now, but he bought land. Other black people heard and came. This guy came in and, and, and um, built a luxury hotel for other blacks to come. We came together to take care of each other back then. This is what we did. Um, it goes on to say demands for equal rights were ongoing. Um, on Greenwood Avenue, from them working together, <laughs> from them working together in their own communities, they built luxury shops, restaurants, grocery stores, hotels, jewelry and clothing stores, movie theaters, barbershops, salons, libraries, pool halls, nightclubs, doctors, lawyers, dentists. They had their own bank, hospital, bus and taxi service, post office. They did all this stuff coming together. Some had more than others, but it didn't matter. They came together and this is what they built. 
and we're living better than some white folk. But it's not even about that. It's about the fact that they came together. And when we come together, it does something, and it scares people <laughs> when we come together. When our black men actually step up and take care of black women and black children, it scares them. Because when we come together, we do something wonderful. And what eventually happens is Black Wall Street burnt it down. They accused the man of trying to rape some woman in the elevator or something because what some of them did, they still went out and worked. And then the money they did make, they brought back into their own community. And it says in here that the money that they made changed hands 19 times before it left the community. 19 times. A dollar was stay in the black community 19 times before it left out. We don't have none of that now. Not in Poughkeepsie, I ain't gonna speak for it. But not, we don't have that. We have others that come here. We have the Asians that come here all in nail salons and eyebrows and their money change hands. We never see it. We have the Arabs come in with their stores. They, they sending their money back. China, they sending their money back home taking care of their people. Us, we, we don't support. But again, it goes back to us not coming together. But money changed hands 19 times before I left the community. If we did something like do you understand what, we, what would happen if we did that? If each of us right here in the room said, you know, we're going to put up one G and we're going to open up a, a store somewhere on the corner here. And then from there, just like, if we, if we did that as a community, what we can do for us, what we, all the stuff that we're fighting for, because unfortunately, thank God for grants and thank God for people who do want to give money to underprivileged neighborhoods like us and our children, but we can do so much more with us. Ain't got to beg nobody for nothing. And that's exactly what Black Wall Street is an example. That's why I love this story, because of what they built together with nothing, with nothing. Um, and then eventually, after they accused the man of trying to rape the woman, now they come riots into their community, burn things up, killed about 300 of them, about 800 of them injured, houses, shops, everything burnt to the ground. And it was really all about jealousy. Because how could these people do all this? And we've been trying to oppress them. We've been doing our best to kill them off. And they just ain't going nowhere. And they did this. They ain't got no money. We taking all their money. And they did this. That's who we are. We got the hand of the most high on us. And when we come together and act right, <laughs> when we act right, that's the key. God does some things for us. And that's about stop crying out to Pharaoh and cry out to the Most High. He does some things for us when we cry out to him. Because everybody put together in this whole universe is not mightier than God. God can do what he want, when he want. He is still in control of it all. No matter what's going on, no matter who's in the White House, no matter who's the mayor here, no matter what positions anybody hold, God is still in control. And the only reason why things is happening is because he letting it happen. Because he can shut it down at any time. That's why we got to stop crying out to Pharaoh, because Pharaoh ain't going to help us. He's not going to help us. Only God can do it. But Black Wall Street, we, we, can, we can be an example of that. And, that. and that puts fear in the hearts of black people, too, because it's, it's like they have the power. Power. They outnumber us. They have the power because they tried to stand their ground, but they were outnumbered. You know, um, it was about what seventy-five of them and hundreds of white people who came. So they they tried to stand their ground because they they worked hard and they built a lot. But this is one of those intimidations and them having more guns and having more people than we had. So part of the process, another part of the process of keeping us oppressed is redlining. I don't know if anybody knows what redlining is, but it's the act is dubbed redlining for, well, let me just break it down in layman's terms. So if we had a map of Poughkeepsie, I wish I did that. If we had a map of Poughkeepsie, they would place a red line, let's say from Rip, they're kind of changing around, but let's say they would have a red line around Rip, they would have a red line around here, around what we consider the hood, Winnikey and all that. It would be a red line around those areas that they consider the hood and the ghetto. And 
So when people come to buy houses, when they go see a real estate agent or they go to the bank to get mortgages, depending on, they would deny them. Or like, let's say me as a real estate agent, a white person came to me and I said, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have you go to this neighborhood because, you know, so that's red line. Those red lines were the neighborhoods that they stayed away from. Um, and they, and that's how ghettos were made. That's how they were made from redlining. So it's not that we were just poor and ain't have nothing and we just, the ghetto just formed. No, it was government <laughs> who redlined and said, no, y'all gonna stay out of here. This is gonna be where they are. If you think about it, um, Hurricane Katrina. And then when I went down there a couple years ago, I had the chance to actually see it. Um, French quarters got flooded a little bit. It was the ghettos that got destroyed. Because it, it depends on demographics, on where you're at, where the ghetto is. Because those are the places, if something like that happens, that will get destroyed. French Quarter was maybe five, 10 minutes from that part of um, New Orleans, from that part of, um, yeah, New Orleans. And had a little water damage. You go, and, and this was five or six years ago. We went down there, I went down there with the national, with the um, convention. And we were on a trolley or something. They brought us through those neighborhoods. You couldn't even, they still didn't do anything with those neighborhoods. You couldn't even get out. The grass was so high. You ain't know what you would. It was a house like here, then a house by the police station. Like that's how spread out they were. It was terrible. They didn't do anything in that neighborhood. Five minutes away up the block, you at the French Quarter. Nothing, nothing is wrong. But they, 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 they also were the demographics of where that's where the ghetto um, where they, where they made it. So the red line is that keeping. Go ahead. Another thing with red lining, within those areas, there was high cost of everything, like car insurance and so many other things designed to keep the people poor. Yeah. And then they would have, um, for example, when there were housing projects, you had police going into parking lots, writing tickets people though they were off the street. So the people had more cost. Because I remember before I moved up here, I would have to budget out so much for parking tickets <laughs> because it was like it was you you that was your partner. You had to pay. You had a car, you had tickets. But I remember they would come off the street into those areas, into the off street parking lots. So um, that was the other effect of some of the other effects of red lines. thing about New Orleans was a plan. They knew that the levees weren't going to hold. They knew that. And the reason for that, because they looked at the property and they needed those people out of there and they knew they weren't going to leave. So by allowing what happened, happened, because there was plenty of time to tell them to get them out and enough time. Because when I went down to visit and it's different than what it was originally speaking to people that are from Lafayette that moved down there to change the whole area different than what it was. And all the people that had homes are gone, but they're building up and they're gonna do what, what they do. And that's the bottom line, which is sad because it changed everything. When I was down there, I was really disappointed because I think the food I was expecting, I like to eat, wasn't what I got. And, um, and they were telling the story, people that were from Louisiana that lived that, from that area that were leaving because they can't make it there their houses, they're not coming to help them with that. But yet, there's another person from another area, another district, coming here, buying a, 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 a restaurant, bringing in their food, and things of that nature. So it was definitely deliberate. I would just like to say that the red line still takes place today. Um, because I know of an individual who was playing professional football, for the Dallas Cowboys and Woody and his family decided they wanted to buy a house because he was going to have a long-term contract. His wife went to the realtor and said, we want to look in this particular area. And they told him, no, we have problem homes in this particular area for you to look at as opposed to the quote-unquote white neighborhood. So they weren't even allowed as a professional football player making millions of dollars to go into the particular area he wanted to go to because the real estate agent would not let them go. 
still happening today. Yeah, it is against from the Fair Housing Act. That's that's one of the things that was birthed out of um, the civil the civil rights movement. Yeah, yeah, they do do a settlement. And then I don't know if you guys have read the article of reparations by Sonny C. Coates, um, but it talks about that's one of the major themes in it is the redlining, and it talks about those that move um, like further up north to be able to buy homes. And so this was back in. 30, 40, something like that. But they would move, like there was this one particular guy um, who bought a house, and what they used to do with the redlining thing, is they would never let you own the house. So let's just say you came in and you rented a house and it was average $800 a month, let's just say. They would charge you $2,400 or $3,000 a month and let you miss a payment. They got your stuff out, but they, so, and they wouldn't give you, like, because banks wouldn't give you um, loans. They would give they would give the FHA, FHA loans, which had the lowest percentage, of course, the white people, but the black people, they just made it so hard with this redlining thing. And um, it was in that in that um, article, just it was it's devastating, like to see what they did, and this is the part of the process, the part of the system that we put in place when we tried to get ahead, we just keep getting kicked back down. So redlining was one of those. Civil rights movement. I didn't put much, because I believe that we know enough about it. But what I wanted to point out about the civil rights movement, I got um, MLK and Malcolm X, Black Panthers. I like to always talk about them because um, they were three, well, Fred Hampton and, and even Huey P. Newton before his, but they were um, black men who just had a great mouthpiece Whatever their religion was, they just had a great mouthpiece for, for us. Um, um, let me see where was I going. And because of that, the counterintelligence program. I know the COINTEL about that. Now, really, to me, that was one of, uh, besides slavery, that was probably the one of the dirtiest things that they did to black people, um, the government. But the counterintelligence program, and and that's why I mentioned MLK and Malcolm X and. Black Panther movement because this is where they infiltrate it. And this is one of the ways that they get us to turn against each other. So it was started by J. Edgar Hoover in 1956. Since the program, um, its tactics have been used by the FBI, CIA, federal, local, and state authorities in order to stop movements within the U.S. Um, that the government determined to be dangerous or undesirable. The purpose of this new counterintelligence endeavor is to expose, disrupt, and these are from the words of Hoover's mouth. The purpose of this new counterintelligence endeavor is to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize, otherwise kill the activities of black nationalist hate type organizations. Now, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, nor the Black Panthers. Now, the Black Panthers in the media, don't get me wrong, it, but anyway, in the media, they were portrayed but they had a wonderful breakfast program that fed kids every morning before they went to school, right? And it still goes on. Um, they also, and, and this was big because there were black men who were actually doing something for kids, and especially kids that didn't have father figures. They would see this. They would actually see black men. Black Panthers police their own community. They were black men who actually took care of their community, of black women, of black children, protecting them. They had guns and all that, okay, whatever. Protecting them from police and the KKK. And because they were protecting their own, J. Edgar Hoover considered this hate because they're protecting their own and demolished them. Killed Fred Hampton in his bed. Shout out, they went up in there and shot that man's house up. Killed him because um, Malcolm X, MLK, they infiltrated their organizations and they turned people against them. Malcolm X, did y'all see the documentary on Netflix, the new one? Wonderful documentary. Awesome. A lot of research done, and it gets down to who possibly killed him, which we it's, it's the truth, but his own killed him. 
And they said that in Malcolm X's camp, it was more police, more FBI, more undercover than it was black people, like just regular people in his camp because they infiltrated. And the reason why the man who killed him never got arrested is because guess what? FBI had their hands all over it. This is what they do, right? When we have, when we have black people, and this is very discouraging, when they have black people, especially black men, who stand up and fight, and, and they're not even physically fighting. They're just intelligent. They're, they're, they can get people together. Malcolm X, MLK, and Fred Hampton, they can get people together of all races. It wasn't just black people they got together. They got all, all races together to come together and fight for rights. And they could not have it, and because of it, they were considered to be hate when they wanted to just take care of us. So, and that's something else that's discouraging when you're trying, you know, instead of having our young boys out here on the street, they have these type of organizations to really um, grow up as a man and be a man and to show you to not be out on the streets, but to take care of family, take care of your family, do what you're supposed to do. But then they gun down our, our leaders and they say it's hate. And this is what our government does to us. Stop crying out for foul, and you see what you see what they do, right? And let me just say this. Let me just say this before I move on. This is not meant to make anybody hate anybody. This is just education. It's 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 a, an awakening. It's just to keep us woke about what's really going on, because honestly, um, it can make you feel a certain way. But that's not what this is meant to do. This is just meant for us to have knowledge and to know what's going on, so we know how to move. We gotta know how to move. Okay, so this is coming at me, okay, I got to go this way. This is coming, okay, I'm going this way. We know how to move, and that's what it's about. Because as people of God, ain't no hate. There's no hate. But we gotta know what's going on. We can't be, we can't be dumb and naive and expect to get, you know, to get somewhere. We gotta know what's going on so that we can serve and do what we need to do. All right, y'all got to see it. I'm sorry, I'm going this way now. You coming this way? I, you know, boxing. Who watched the fight the other night? <laughs> Poor thing, but anyway. So, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Deborah. Um, not that it's on there, but just something else that um, white people did is during the World War II, Japanese Americans, when they put them in camps, but when they got out, they got paid for why they were there. We're still waiting? Yeah, still waiting. Yep. And you know, and it's funny because even with MLK, you know, we have this, I have a dream speech, but he woke up. That's why they killed him, he woke up. Because he started speaking out against the Vietnam War, and he woke up, he was like, and even with integration, we're gonna, oh, it's eight o'clock, y'all. Um, all right, but even with integration, um, he realized that was, that was a bad thing. Because when it comes to our education, um, to me, I think that integration of schools, I, I personally, I, I don't think it was the best decision. Because now you got our black kids who were taught by black teachers, right? Now you're integrating them into a system where white are dominant. So now they're not learning about their own history. They're learning about this other history and got nothing to do with them. And now you have black kids in the, in, the, in the room with white kids who, in the history books, all you see is white people who done done this, this, and this, and black kids can't relate. So now they're not interested. There, there's nothing in here that's interesting to them. Then Duran said last week that even in Poughkeepsie, our, ki our black kids don't see a black teacher until maybe when they get to high school, I believe he said. So not only, and listen, we're, we're every, everybody's different, nationalities, ethnic groups are different. We need more black teachers to teach our black kids to, so that they can see us because we know how to deal with them. I'm gonna give you an example, on, on, on my bus, I have this, I have, well he's not on my bus anymore now because now he's in BOCES. But he was a little a little black, he was hyperactive, he was more, okay, and unfortunately, our counterparts don't know how to particularly deal with our kids, especially our, our young black boys, our young black girls, they don't know how to deal with us. We're, you know, so when we do act out or we may get angry, it's always and because of what they think, it's, oh, they always think it's something else. We have ADD or something's wrong, we gotta be on medication. No, 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 you just have to know how to deal with us. And unfortunately, they don't. So on my bus, this kid was a problem at first, okay? He was a problem at first, but I know how to handle him because I know how to handle our black children. That kid was not a problem to me anymore. 
But because he went to a white school, they didn't know how to handle him. So they keep on forcing his mom, no, he can't stay here. He got, they kept on, he's in kindergarten. They were suspending him. It was some of the things I couldn't believe. I was like, wait, he's doing that in class? When I'm, I have 20 kids on a bus, I'm driving, and I can control him while I'm driving. So why can't you control him in the classroom? I got this kid on the bus wanting to clean the bus for me. Miss Stacy, I give him a look. He's like, I'm sorry. But you, and I'm driving. <laughs> and you can't control this kid in the classroom. But that's because they have to see us. And they don't. And they're not interested. They're not learning their history. We didn't learn our history. Another thing school does for our kids is it crosses God out the equation. They start teaching them about um, we came from monkeys and the Big Bang Theory. So it's like, wait, but God, I thought God created the world. But we come from monkeys? When, who's a monkey? It questions, it makes them, they do that from the jump because it's, it's not a Christian nation. That's what they used to tell us, but it's really not. Um, so they, they, school puts, it changes things. The education system changes things for our kids. So I personally think that integration wasn't the best. I think that we need to be taught because we then were taught our true history. So, um, and, and MLK saw that. He realized that. He said, integration, no, this, was, this might have been a mistake. And when he started waking up and talking about other things, that's when they killed him because he's a threat because he can bring people together. And of all races, he can bring us together. All right. It's 8.01. I'm going to shut down. So look at war on drugs and mass incarceration. And um, war on drugs is really a war in the black community. How they put crack in our, in our neighborhoods. We were either smoking it or selling it. And as soon as they put the crack in the neighborhoods, that's when they got stricter with the prison laws. And then boom, another mass incarceration. We got over two million people in jail today. But read on war on drugs, and definitely, I did this so that you guys can study on your own these topics, and just to understand the systems that were put in place. And the question is, what can we do better as a community? What can we do better for our community? What can we do better as far as coming together? It's important for us to come together. Um, look at welfare. They did break down of families with welfare. Now the man got to be out of the house. Yes. And, and breaks down marriages. You know, um, black women, look at the percentage of out of wedlock. Now black women are having more kids out of wedlock than married. And welfare, welfare was one of the things that's a breakdown of family too. Because when the man is not in the house, when it's not, when you're, because you're less likely to have abortions when you're married. You're less like, you know what I'm saying? But with, with um, welfare, what it does is it keeps us in poverty. We don't have two, we don't have mothers and fathers in the home. So it keeps us in poverty with welfare. Yes. outlines how the rations were given out once a month. It was a, clearly the welfare system. And keeping the, the family separated, the father out the house yeah. in a black home, it yeah. wasn't everybody. Yeah. Because when Spanish families went in, it was the husband and the wife and the kids and they got sisters. In the black homes, they kept the father out because remember, if you came out of slavery, the master was your father. Yeah. Was you didn't have a father. You, he was the one telling you what to do. And that is what welfare did and a lot of these systems did. Yeah. And one thing I want to say about um, integration, it had its benefits because they're not going to undereducate your kids if they're sitting in the same classroom as their kids. So you did get a better education, but there needed to be some monitoring there and some reinforcement to, of the children's self esteem. So you had to do a lot of teaching at home so that they could get through the browbeating mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. let's face it, mm -hmm. when you're in a job where you is predominantly white and you stand in your ground and you 
there, you really are making more money. So there was a there was an economic benefit to um, integration, and you learn how to get along with all races because when our children grow up in segregated school districts, they don't know how to handle it when they get out into the workplace and they get into situations where there are more people who are Caucasian. And so it does, in fact, cause socialization issues that, uh, when they get up there as adults. Mm -hmm. So it has its benefits. There are some drawbacks, but it has its benefits. And then I, I just want to add to this, and I won't take up much of your time, but just from knowledge now and working at the Department of Social Services, now known as uh, the Community and Family Services for the past 26 years, I have come to learn and find out that welfare wasn't just for us, our color skin. With us, I have learned and found out through managing cases for the past 26 years, it's more of them that are getting the benefits and the advantages. And what's so sad, even with that system that was created, they know how to maneuver and manipulate the system. They're homeowners. They have different clauses. They could have assets over a million dollars, but there's loopholes for them, and they can claim spousal refusal of income and still be eligible to get these very same benefits, but yet there's aged people that are 65 years old, and because they have just a little bit more in the bank account, they're not eligible. You know, so it, it's, it's a lot. You know, they have learned to now how to, to master the system to their advantage as well. So it's not just, it wasn't just for us. They learned to, to use it for themselves and to the, for their advantage too. So it's more of them getting the benefits, really, than us. We're, we're not really the majority. We're the minority because it's really them. All right, wrap it up, 807. But definitely finish on war on drugs, mass incarceration, and do some studying. And I thank you guys. This was wonderful. And, and also, again, this is not for you to hate, but it's to, it's to have knowledge of what's going on, the process and the system. And then you'll be more empathetic because we can't blame it all on us. It, we have been, as a systematic, yes. And it was meant to keep us down, keep us oppressed. But we have to overcome it. And hopefully we can have a follow-up on how to overcome it. But, but good night. Thank you. Put our hands together for Stacey one more time. <laughs> this has been wonderful, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Where do we go? Where do we go from here? What do we, what do we do from here? How do we, uh, how do we include this kind of teaching and instruction uh, on ongoing, on an ongoing basis in the in in, in our church? Um, we do this. We we did that this month because of Black History Month, but it's been alluded to in every session that the misinformation that our young people are getting. How can we make this kind of teaching? You coming down, John? Uh, uh, how can we make this kind of instruction a part? Um, if, we, if we, on Friday nights, if we show the kind of documentaries and have these kind of discussions, what kind, what can we do? What, where do we go? Where do we go from here? Uh, where do we go here? What can we bite off right here? What can we start? What can we bite off and chew? I mean, the problems are huge. They're gargantuan. But what little piece can you bite off and what can you chew? Uh, Diane, what, what, what can we do politically? Uh, we say the problem, well, you know, does my little vote count? What, what, what do we do politically? What do we do in terms of, uh, of uh, of education. Uh, uh, for those who presented, uh, uh, Gil West and Stacy and Jonathan, do uh, you have any questions? Any questions or recommendations? Uh, uh, Stacy, Gil, Jonathan, uh, 
What do you, what's your takeaway, Jonathan, Stacy, Gill, from what we tried to do? Anybody else? What's our takeaway from this? Did we just do this to do this? Oh, we got a lot of good information. Oh, my, that show was nice. Oh, my. Pastor B set aside. Pastor B gave up the Bible class to talk about black history. Well, did I do that just to get out of teaching the Bible? Or what if, what's the benefit of doing this? We just, we just learned, a, got a lot of good information. What then do we do with it? Uh, and and I'm, I, was, I wanted to, you know, to close the lecture at 8 o'clock. It can take about 15 minutes for discussion. But if you can get, give me just maybe about 10 extra minutes, 10 or 15 extra minutes to talk about this. Where do we go from here? What do you see our plight and our plan? Um, what kind of system do we need to take about? There's a system in place of uh, red light. can we do? What little bit can we bite off and chew? How, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. What's your, what's your overview, Jonathan? Stacy, Gilbert, Diane, come on, come up. Come up here, Diane. Come on, come on. Come on, come on up here, Diane. Come on, come on. Don't, don't you come up here. Come on, come on. You got a bad leg? Okay. You got a bad leg, right? I was just thinking about we can integrate um, this information on a kid's level in the Sunday school lesson. Um, depends, on what we, depends on what we're teaching that day, but that can be done as a start. Well, my question is, how do we get it from these walls to our community? Okay, no, that's what I just I, asked you. you. Asked. That's what I'm just asking you to tell me how to do that. Yeah, that's the question I'm asking. I, I think it's, it's a unity thing. Okay, that, now, now what can you do to help make that happen? I can be part of that unity. Okay, how, how, what can you do to make that happen? I can, I can give my voice, I can give my time to go out and help educate and support our community. Okay. I know the ought to's, we ought to. Now, and I say you ought. can see in most, in, in most of my preaching, my preaching used to be a lot of ought to, ought to, ought to. Right. But nowadays my preaching is taking more of a how to. How to. We, we, we strong on the ought to, the ought to, the ought to, but we very short on the how to. And so how do we do this? We, we see this concern great. We know the needs. We know what needs to be done. But how do we do it? And I'm going to identify... Um, what's our role as a church? What's, what can we do as a church? Uh, the others who have been talking to me about my role as a pastor. What's my role as a pastor in this? What's your role? What can you do? And when those who talk to me about my role as a pastor, you know, they're not saying that this is what you need to do. They're saying this to me because I've asked them to help me identify my role. And so what is your role? What can we do together? What part can you play in making this happen? The need is there. And particularly with our children, with our kids, things are going down. We need unity in the community. I mean, there's so much duplication of services going on around here. Everybody's having this little meeting, run this meet, this meet, meet. Everybody duplicating services. If we just come together and put it together, put all of our shoulders behind the same wheel, we could push this thing and make it happen to have a greater impact. And there is strength in numbers. Now, I'll tell you, white folk ain't going to never worry about us because they know we're going to be so busy fighting among ourselves that we'll never ever be strong enough to take them on. 
because we're going to be concerned about who gets the credit. Which denomination is it? Which church is leading? Which pastor's out front? Who's going to get the credit? You know, the job gets to be, yes. I learned in Maris, it was a book, Nakeem Akbar would bring us up, Psychological Images of Slavery. And their tactics have not changed. It's to take the male figurehead out of the house and disun disunify the family unit. So the only thing that I can do is when I see a family structure because I'm alone is to encourage them to stay together and to serve God as a family. Okay. So your role can be that of an encourager. All right. Yes, Diane. Oh, John. I was just going to say we also have to continue these conversations past February. A lot of times we get this really big impact, Black History Month, I'm black and I'm proud. Um, I'm happy to be black. I'm proud of my melanin. I'm, my black is beautiful for February. But by the time we get to April, conversations have quieted down. We've moved on to other issues. We start thinking about other things or nothing at all. But to have these conversations continue on a continuing basis to allow um, each of us, like I know I was rushing through what I was trying to get through. Um, and I didn't get to all of it, and that's okay. But to have time to stop and talk about it, to have a conversation around it. Um, I was up there talking to, uh, to Bobby about what Ms. Ann said, is because I work in the same building she works in. There is a stigma around social services um, that is easily dismissed with statistics. And all we have to do is put up a chart and suddenly our mindset changes of these things, but it's just a matter of having a place to have the conversation and the time. You um, graciously allowed us to take up the Bible study hour. And I don't imagine that's going to continue indefinitely, mm -hmm. but also creating an opportunity and a space where we can come together on some sort of consistent basis to continue these conversations about the history of the African American in this church, about uh, racial structures and oppressive um, systems that keep us and how we can get over them, and starting that conversation about what I can do as a member of the Beulah Baptist Church and a member of the City of Poughkeepsie to break the stereotypes, to break the generational curses, to break the chains, what I can do and how I can inspire and equip others as we all can as well. The idea is that if we take the time past February to continue to talk about these things, not to be Debbie Downers, not to be woe is me, not to just cry and cry and cry, but to say this is the reality of what it is, but my reality is not, my current reality is not my ultimate destiny. I was created to be more than a conqueror. How do I get to that? How do I break down systems? How do I help my sisters break glass ceilings? How do I continue past February? Is that, is that what I said? How? <laughs> okay. Now you know. You, okay. Now you know you're gonna be part of that. You, you already knew that, didn't you? I think that also too, I think that also um, too, that people say, well, it's not Bible study. It absolutely is Bible study. Um, so I think that's something, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of biblical reference that I, you know, was studying as I didn't just study Old Testament's history. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a his, it's history book. So I think that once people get away from that, they're like, why are you doing that in church? Well, because it's been done in the churches. Churches was a safe place for, you know, um, Martin Luther King and all the stuff that he did. It wasn't government supported. It was supported by churches and black people. And, and that's what we did. So it's kind of like getting back to that and supporting each other. And, it, and black history definitely is biblical. Bible we, it is no problem for me to go back in here and put scriptures with all this. I was rushing. You know, I had to get... Thank you. I had to get stuff, but th this is this is biblical. A lot of this stuff, you know, and and slave, all this is biblical. So definitely, got to get people out of the stereotype that this has nothing to do with Bible because that's not true. As a community, for every church that is here in the city of Poughkeepsie, why is it that we all don't come together? like for every church. Because for every church, somebody's child is in our school district. Somebody's child is on that street. 
So if we come, when we talk about unity, and we want to start with the house of God, why for every church in Poughkeepsie, we're not able to come together? Because those are our children, somebody's child in one of these churches in the city of Poughkeepsie. And I'm not talking about the town, and I'm talking right here in the city of Poughkeepsie for every church. And I took one day to ride around the city of Poughkeepsie on a day off, and there is a lot of churches. Okay, so your response to this is right, you're gonna ride around. <laughs> now you know what I'm gonna ask you. Now you know what I'm gonna ask you. You know I'm coming back at that. Okay. Okay. So after you rode around, you saw them all, so you're going you come, you got a plan. Amen. I miss, I'm anxious to hear that plan. That's what we need. Yes, ma'am. I want to hear your plan. I want to hear know what David Dump is going to do and what, what, you, what your role is. What we do as far as um, um, black, um, the social action is voter registration. There's enough young people out there that can't vote but don't know what they can do to vote because the, we have lawyers here that can help. What do you need to do so that you can vote? Every voice counts. They need to know that. It took one person for him not to get impeached. So if one person can do, one person can make a difference. They need to understand that. So getting out and making sure that more young people know if they can't vote, why not? What do you need to do in order to be able to vote? They need to know that they still have rights and what do they need to do? And that's something that I will continue to do with the voter registration. Okay, now how are you gonna, so the Social Action Committee is gonna mount a serious, aggressive voter education and the voter registration drive. Is that right? You're gonna lead that, right? We'll be a part of it. No, 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 yes. you gotta lead it. You gotta lead it, you gotta lead okay. it. Yeah, All right. yeah, yes. yeah. Okay. yeah, we gotta do it. That'll be your part. My part is going to be bringing the people together. Bringing the people together, bringing the pastors together, bringing the stakeholders together to develop this plan. And God has given me so much talent right here for those who presented, you know, that we're going to have an agenda here. And yes, John, the, the, the ongoing dialogue, yes. Any other suggestions or recommendations? As to, as to what we can do, and any suggestions you have for me, uh, I've been talking to some other pastors and some other stakeholders in, in the community about this very, very thing, and any suggestions you have for me, let me know and see what we can do about it. Because our community and, and some of the, the system has us on lockdown, so we gotta change the system. Banks, the community outreach banks draw their deposits. They have an obligation to lend money right back into those communities. And they were not doing it. Um, when you go into the bank and say, let me see your HUMDA. HUMDA. That's the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. Banks have to report quarterly on mortgages and things that they've done in the community. And to go in and say, let me see your HUMDA report. That's what your bank sends to the head of the every quarter on loans that you've made in the community. And you can see where, where those loans were made and to whom those loans were made. So there are a number of things that we can do. We just need a plan to come together. And the, the plan is, uh, the, the problem is so huge. So we're going to identify some little pieces, bite-sized pieces, and bite it off. So how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. All right. Uh, and, and those of you who spoke, Jason, John, McGill, and Michelle, and Debbie, and Beth, and Cynthia, you, you all are the, uh, the Black History Committee, uh, the year-round Black History Committee of the church. Anybody else say anything tonight? Anybody else raise make, 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 Lawrence? Everybody that said something tonight. Everybody said something tonight. I just spoke to the All right. Okay. Good enough. That's what we need you to do. John's going to call you all together and work on this.
bunch of donations in there. If you have documentaries, things that we can do on Friday night, uh, we can have panel discussions or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, 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 we open. Let's 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 do it. We need to know who we are. We 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 good on. We know we know whose we are. All right, I want to thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for the preparation and for the presentation. And we, we are better for it. I think we've been sensitized. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's, that's good. All right, any other uh, questions or comments?